Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ferox and today I'd like to give you a long overdue introduction to diabetes mellitus because there's an awful lot of misconceptions about it out there. Now, diabetes mellitus does mean the sugar or the sweet diabetes and glucose is certainly important but it's actually insulin that's the critical feature of this condition. You don't get diabetes by eating sugar. You get it because your insulin is either not enough or not working properly. Now your pancreas is a nifty little organ that has exactly two jobs. One is to make digestive enzymes so that you can actually use the food that you eat. And the other is to make our friend insulin. It's only got two jobs and when it fails to do them, things go spectacularly badly. Insulin is a little protein that looks a little bit like that. It's very fragile, which is why diabetics are told that you roll your insulin to mix it rather than shake it vigorously because you can physically break this molecule. It's also very easily digested which is why insulin is always injected, not fed. And its job is to affect the blood glucose levels. So insulin will make your blood glucose levels drop because it puts them into the cells where they're used to make energy. Glucose is the simplest sugar molecule. It's the one we measure most easily because it's cheap to do so whereas measuring insulin is difficult because it's such a fragile molecule. Glucose is small and stable and it's used for energy by basically every single cell in the body. It's also very tightly controlled between insulin, which pushes it into cells, and glucagon, which is made by the liver to pull glucose out of your carbohydrate and fat stores. In a normal patient, glucose is maintained within a normal range by the actions of insulin and glucagon. It might go up over the day, especially after eating, and then gradually drift down just with time and normal activity until they eat again, in which case it will go up. That's perfectly normal. In a diabetic where there's either no insulin or not enough insulin, the glucose can't enter the cell. So they are typically very very high and they stay high trying to let that glucose enter the cell by passive diffusion and they might even be potentially three or four times higher than a normal animal there are some things that will make your glucose just a little bit higher than normal so foods with a high glycemic index can cause a spike but they often come down very quickly when insulin's doing its job. Stress will also increase their normal reference range. And in a vet clinic, most of our patients are stressed. So will fear and infection. Now with our dogs and cats, we typically give them the same dose of insulin every day, at the same time, every day, with the same meal every day. Humans don't do that because humans are much more variable in their daily activities but humans can monitor themselves. With our dogs and cats, that's a real pain to do because they spend the whole day in the vet clinic and the stress of being in the vet clinic often makes their results falsely high. So with our diabetic, they will typically eat in the morning and their in glucose will be fairly high. They get their insulin And there's multiple different types with different durations of action. And it will drop and hopefully spend most of the time in the normal reference range until they're fed again and they get more insulin. It's not perfect, but they spend most of their day in the normal reference range. With our dogs and cats, when they're diabetic, we're really hoping to get them to live for maybe 15 or so years. 
so we don't see complications that we often see in our long-term human diabetics. Because a human diabetic, you're kind of hoping you'll get to 80 years. And so there's more time for potential complications to accumulate, like a diabetic neuropathy. Dogs and cats, they're just not going to live for 80 years, no matter what you do. So how does diabetes arise? Well, quite simply, they either have not enough insulin or they have, quite frankly, none of it at all. Or they're resistant to insulin, which falls under not having enough. We don't really talk about type 1 and type 2 diabetics in our dogs and cats because, frankly, it doesn't matter. We're going to treat them exactly the same anyway. All of our diabetic pets are maintained with insulin rather than diet alone, though diet can certainly be helpful in many cases. Sometimes diabetes will arise secondary to pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is any condition that has insulted the pancreas, and it basically causes those digestive enzymes to leak. Insulin, as you'll recall, is a very fragile molecule. If you can break it by shaking the bottle too hard, you can understand how you can break it by leaking digestive enzymes onto it. This is why you can't eat insulin, it's always injected. It's a bit of a design flaw to have one organ responsible for producing insulin that is also responsible for producing your digestive enzymes. But that's beside the point. You can also get a very interesting traumatic pancreatitis where the organ is physically crushed, such as in a car accident. In these cases, the diabetes is sometimes temporary and will resolve as the pancreas heals, but sometimes it is permanent. We also probably get immune-mediated destruction of pancreas cells. I say probably because we never biopsy this organ. Not for diabetes anyway. It just doesn't matter clinically, so why would you subject a dog or a cat to unnecessary surgery? You can also get it secondary to other metabolic conditions. So Cushing's is a very common one in dogs and acromegaly is a common one in cats. What these ones do is they increase the base level of where your glucose is usually sitting. So everything is more exaggerated than it otherwise would have been which might be enough to just tip them into diabetes. Not all dogs with Cushing syndrome or all cats with acromegaly have diabetes, but those that do are often more insulin resistant and more difficult to get under control. Cats in particular might require insulin doses that are 10 times the normal dose for a cat. It's just what they do. Technically, certain drugs can do the same thing, so cortisone will also increase the base levels of glucose, which makes a diabetic on cortisone more difficult to manage or more exaggerated symptoms. The cortisone on its own doesn't cause the disease, it just makes it worse. And cats, as a side note, cats are very weird. Cats can go into diabetic remission, especially on a high protein diet, but they can do it on any diet at any time, whenever they feel like it. And you can't predict which ones will do it and which ones will not. So cats have to be monitored particularly closely. If you have a cat that's gone into diabetic remission, or really any animal whose insulin requirement has changed, and you give them insulin, they will potentially drop far too low into a hypoglycemic crisis. This just means that their sugar is way too low. This is an emergency because every single cell in the body needs that sugar to live, including the brain. And these animals might be wobbly, hungry, because they are trying to live. 
or they might just die, sometimes with a seizure, because a seizure uses up even more of the glucose you had left. So it just kind of snowballs. This is the reason we always say that it is safer to underdose your diabetic than to overdose them, especially when you're trying to figure out their dose at the start of their disease. Long-term underdosing will lead to diabetic ketoacidosis. And there's a whole other video on that for you that you can peruse at your leisure. It's what happens when you've got diabetics that are sick and they are catastrophically sick. But the pathology is really cool and interesting if you're into that sort of thing. So check out the video on DKA when you get a chance. There's also a video on Cushing syndrome if you're interested in knowing more about that. And it's also worth checking out blogs by people who are actually diabetic. It just makes you a bit more sympathetic to what your non-speaking patients are going through and a bit firmer about insisting clients actually treat their pets properly instead of in a sort of half-assed way. Now I will just say before I finish up that there's an awful lot of false information out there about diabetes mellitus and an awful lot of false cures. Things like drinking water to cure your diabetes. Things like eating fruit or eating honey. or making a mixture of fennel seeds and whatever else it was. Not a single one of these things replaces the missing insulin. Sure, drinking water is great, eating fruit is great, but none of it replaces the insulin molecules that you need or the beta cells that produce it. Diabetics especially type 1, need their insulin. Our diabetic pets need their insulin. There isn't a magic bullet that you can just eat to make everything feel better. Though cats get kind of close, but it's very unpredictable whether it actually works or not. So it's not just about sugar and eating too little or too much. It's about insulin. Thank you for listening. My name is Dr. Ferox. I clearly need a new pen. And I'll catch you next time.